Okay, all right. Um, how are you today? Wednesday? It's okay. Surviving, I guess. Um, oh, that's right. I'm going to leave it a little you know, louder today because I have uh, videos to show. So don't worry about too much of um, sound initially. So maybe I would reduce a little bit anyway. Okay, so Monday, what did you learn? Uh, <laughs> what did we learn Monday? CO2, CO2 that's right. Um, and CO2 effects on photosynthesis mainly. <laughs> and then two at the end, remember we did a um, little exercise, sort of mathematical modeling, so sort of you know, you got flavor of what is mathematical modeling, right? So I got a few questions um, regarding other factors affecting that photosynthesis. Um, it's a very simple diffusion equation, right? And then what are the other factors? And one of the other factors we are learning today is the wind, wind environment, okay? Okie dokie. Um, so I'm going to answer those questions when, whenever I can in, in this presentation. All right? Okay. Uh, hello. There you go. All right, so the winds, there's one reading uh, material to um, help you understand from the Plant Growth Chamber Handbook. Those are all online materials um, from website, so I have a direct link to the website. Um, but if you want to see the whole chapters, then, then this is the link, um, HTTP, NCR 101, Montana, EDU. Okay, so that's the link. Um, and we are going to talk about wind. So when you talk about, oh, ha ha, there you go. Tend to forget. Um, so when we talk about wind in the open field production, crop science, crop production, um, you know, context, wind is sometimes negative factor. You want to avoid wind, right, to, for example, to protect your uh, fragile young seedlings to start. Um, but my talk is more positive influence of wind. So if wind is too much, of course, it, it, it creates mechanical damage and stress, desiccation and all. But what I'm talking today is relatively low range of wind in terms of speed, wind speed or velocity, then how that is important in terms of gas exchange and heat exchange um, between air and plants. Okay, so that's, that's the goal. Um, so the um, very important factor, circulation of air or wind inside a, a growing system and could be positive or negative, all right? Um, and uh, specifically affect gas exchange, including heat exchange. So this is the last you know, lectures, one of the slides, right? Um, having a CO2 concentration in the air, CO2 concentration in the chloroplast, and then there are three um, resistances, and every single one of them is very important, right? Because um, values are almost the same level, you know, the range. Um, well, the stomatal resistance range huge because when it is open and when it is closed, the, the value is 10 times greater. So it, it ranges a lot. And in the same way, um, boundary layer resistance um, is also in a certain range. Um, and uh, the wind is actually affecting here, boundary layer resistance, um, significantly and directly affecting. So that's what we are learning. So um, since we have this slide, I would like to um, talk a little bit about um, you know, um, the mechanism or the how um, the stomatal resistance affect the uh, diffusion flux. Um, so when stomata uh, adjust the closing or opening, right, then that would affect the diffusion directly. 
And then if you learn that um, the CO2 concentration difference is the driving force, okay, just to refresh your mind, driving force. So when CO2 in the air is higher, you know, than ambient, then that creates larger difference, okay, larger difference. That's why more CO2 potentially coming in to the chloroplast. But when chloroplast is not functioning, for example, low temperature, right, or too much light, right, so that, you know, feedback, negative feedback, so chloroplast is not doing really good job. And in that case, consumption of CO2 in this site is slow, and then start accumulating CO2, right? So in that case, um, there is another CO2 concentration to consider in here, in a stomatal cavity, which we call intercellular CO2. So the intercellular CO2 level in here um, is going to increase when you know the the, the consumption of CO2 is is slow down. Okay. So that increase of intercellular CO2 basically reduced the difference between stomatal, you know, um, uh, 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 cavity CO2 concentration and air. So now, so, so the CO2 concentration um, between air and inside the stomata, the difference is getting smaller and smaller. Even though outside is the same because intercellular CO2 is getting high, so that difference is getting small. So that is basically, you know, limiting diffusion, okay? So other factors can be expressed as a factor affecting photosynthesis, right? Another thing, so the CO2, high CO2, we also learned that that would affect the stomatal closure. If you grow plants under high CO2, as a cremation process, plants tend to close stomata, you know, a little bit. So just the stomata opening. And so even though the driving force is bigger, adjusting, that means resistance is now increasing, right? So whether you get, you know, um, proportional increase of increasing CO2 concentration or not is depending on how much plants are responding regarding closing stomata. So that's why, maybe that's why one reason, you know, you don't get that instantaneous big jump when you grow plants under high CO2 for a long time, because they, they basically adjust the stomatal conductance. So, but you can, usually you can still see the, you know, the, the positive increase in terms of growth and yield, and that's something I presented in the table as a reported values, you know, around 10 to 20% of yield increase for tomato, and then much higher, if I remember, um, up to 30% or so um, for the uh, young seedling growth. Okay, all right. So it's all sort of balance. Okay, all right, so now switch back to wind. So the wind is affecting boundary layer, and then how? Um, and then boundary layer um, is also uh, important resistance for transpiration, okay? And uh, um, stomata opening, um, that is basically f um, uh, the exit of water vapor and entrance for the CO2. So that um, stomatal resistance and boundary layer both affect um, uh, transpiration and photosynthesis. So when plants are under stress, they close um, stomata, right, water stress. Um, and then that would um, reduce transpiration rate be because stomatal resistance increase, right? So that reduce the transpiration rate, you know, quite a bit. But that reduction also affect the net photosynthetic rate because it's it's sharing the path. All right. Um, okay. So that's why it's very important to keep the plants, you know, um, under minimum stress. Um, so that stomata are widely open, so that photosynthesis can be maximized. All right. Okay. And then this, the boundary layer. So the boundary layer, because of the same reason, right, because of the transpiration and photosynthesis um, sharing the um, entrance or exit, um, boundary layer also affects both. 
transpiration and photosynthesis. Okay. So what is boundary layer? Hey, what is boundary layer? So, so this is a definition, um, the boundary layer. Basically, it's a sort of layer you, you can't really see because it's in the air. But we name this layer in the air uh, attaching the surface, adjacent to the surface, and then in which you can see sort of you know, the restricted airflow. And then you can see the visual definition, visual version of definition in the next slide. Okay, but, but you got to read this, um, um, you know, um, just to understand how we define boundary layer. Okay, here you go. So to understand boundary layer, it is always good to start with very simple situation. Okay, so simple situation here is a laminar flow. So laminar flow is basically that everything is in the same speed, very uniform profile of uh, wind velocity or air velocity, vertically and maybe horizontally too. You know, in the nature, it's more turbulent, right? If you try to, you know, track the movement of air particle, it's more turbulent. But um, to understand the boundary layer, we use laminar flow. Okay, the, the um, vertically um, very uniform um, uh, airflow. By the way, how many of you actually learned boundary layer? All right, one, two, three, four. Oh, so first time learning boundary layer? Okay, okay, all right. So, um, um, so some of you are already familiar with boundary layer, right? And then some of them are not familiar with. But anyway, so the laminar flow um, situation so if there is no, nothing restricting airflow, it's just continuously laminar flow, right? So the distribution of um, velocity is uniform. So that's, that's here. And then this um, diagram is showing the, you know, when the um, wind hit the surface, okay? So the wind is coming from left-hand side, and this is again laminar flow, very uniform profile, and then moving in and hit the, um, Ooh, hello. Um, the edge of the surface, okay? And the surface is not smooth, right? So there's a friction going on. And that friction prevents the air movement. So if you look at the um, vertical profile of wind velocity, um, any places um, after, you know, wind hit the surface, okay, so this is a side, side view, all right? So that's the surface is, looks like the bar, but it's actually the surface. So you are, you are looking at from the, from the side. Um, but anyway, so after it hits the surface, you start seeing that decline of um, wind velocity because of the viscosity, because of the friction between the surface and um, air. You can apply this in the water too. You know, for example, in the river, if you have a laminar flow, let's say, if you have a laminar flow, and if you look at the, um, the, the, the you know, river flow rate, the speed of water traveling, toward the bottom is usually slow compared to the top because a bunch of stuff in the you know, bottom because of the restriction, because of the friction, right? So, so you see that you know, the, the layer basically um, changing or declining um, velocity, okay? And then velocity goes to nearly zero at the um, surface level, okay? And then if you look at that profile, and then if you, if you see the sort of the boundary um, start showing the decline, that boundary uh, develops over, over the, um, the distance um, across the surface. So when, when, when the, um, the, when the, when the wind hits the edge of the surface, the boundary layer is almost none, okay? And then gradually, gradually increase the thickness. So the boundary layer is becoming thicker and thicker and thicker as wind travel over the surface, okay? And that means thicker is actually uh, meaning that, for example, if there is a, uh, CO2 molecule 
so so the gas is co containing CO2, right? So that if you look at the particular molecule and then it travels around very freely in the laminar flow uh, zone, and then inside here um, is pretty much the movement, um, vertical movement is very much restricted because of the, um, the velocity profile is much um, smaller compared to the um, uh, above the boundary layer. So, so in this situation, um, thicker boundary layer, meaning more resistance for whatever the gas molecule traveling from above the boundary layer, going through the boundary layer, and then uh, inside the, um, uh, whatever the surface. Let's say this is a leaf surface. Okay, so th this is a leaf surface. So the leaf has stomata, and stomatal cavity has lower CO2 concentration. So the larger scale in the air concentration and CO2 concentration in the in the um, leaf is a driving force. So there is a driving force, but the, because boundary layer is thicker in here, there is more resistance for the CO2 molecule traveling by diffusion from above the boundary layer through the boundary layer into the into the plant cell or the um, Tomorrow cavity. Okay, thicker the boundary layer, then you see the uh, greater resistance because of the restricted um, movement by the airflow. And then, if the um, uh, traveling uh, distance is greater, becomes gr greater, then the, it's more turbulent situation. But we are not going to um, consider too much about this uh, in this lecture. All right. Um, so boundary layer can be um, um, visualized um, in um, chambers like this. We call this wind tunnels. So wind tunnel is basically to create laminar flow so that we can visualize under the standardized simplified condition. Okay, so that, um, uh, you know, um, you can actually measure how thick is boundary layer if you can visualize really nicely. And then this, these size of, bound, uh, these size of um, large size of um, uh, uh, wind tunnels like this, it's probably not to visualize the um, boundary layer over the leaf, but more like a boundary layer over the structure, much bigger structure. Um, and then by the way, this one is in uh, agricultural engineering research station. And they have a huge, um, something like a 40 meter or so, um, very large total length um, uh, wind tunnel. So they can place a small uh, a scale model of greenhouse and uh, see the visualized um, uh, air movement inside. Where is that, you said? Like, where is that? The location? Yeah. The location is in Tsukuba in Japan. Yeah, there's a um, Greenhouse Engineering Research Institute, and then they are doing a lot of gas movement in the greenhouse um, using this high tunnel. Uh, uh, not high tunnel, sorry, a wind tunnel. Yeah, so this is what we are looking at, standing in front of the wind tunnel and try to see, you know, how it works. Um, and then, by the way, this is, uh, you know, one of those greenhouses, exactly the same, so that's a scale model. Um, and then you can see actually um, the video showing um, visualization of um, uh, air movement. And they use uh, smoke, and then they use computer program um, to analyze individual particles' movement so that they can create sort of velocity map, you know, two-dimensional. If they want, they can do three-dimensional, too. But the same approach, you can do that in a small scale to visualize the boundary layer over the leaf. All right. So this is old paper, but showing um, a little setup to visualize the leaf um, boundary layer. So it's a tiny little leaf sitting horizontally, again, to simplify horizontal orientation, and then create um, Lamina flow, and then uh, uh, get the smoke um, and visualize using camera. 
and the result is shown this. Um, it's a little bit uh, well, very much vague, but um, so this is a, a, a actual research data visualizing um, boundary layer over cucumber leaf um, at different velocity, and then also um, no, actually only yeah, so the different velocity and two different, um, actually cucumber and cabbage, two different species. Um, so what you are seeing, I think this is probably easier one. So, 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 so those are the basically the, uh, the uh, picture um, of um, visualized boundary layer and leaves. And I'm going to help you to orient what it is. So, so those are the um, wind speed high wind speed centimeter per second all the way down to 25 centimeter per second, right? And what you are seeing in here is basically the uh, side view of the leaf. Cabbage leaf is very large, so that's why sort of, you know, hanging down. So that's why you see the black part is almost like, um, you know, not horizontal straight, but the measurement surface is very straight. But you see the hanging leaf edge, so there, therefore you see the black, you know, shadow in here. But the boundary layer is basically those white, you know, zone layer you can see, and this is also um, visualized using smoke, and then they basically swap the contrast. So the white part is now black, and the black part is white to see, you know, better the boundary layer. So you see that wind direction is from um, your right hand side to left hand side. So uh, you can see that boundary layer starts developing at the windward, right? As soon as um, air hit or the, the wind hit the edge of the um, leaf, and then start developing, you know, like that, right? So that's uh, when you go um, deeper in the leaf, then boundary layer is thicker compared to the edge. Right, and then if you have slower, um, so for example, if you compare this and this, if you have a wind speed slower, then you have thicker boundary layer. If you have a higher wind speed, which is the initial, you know, initial wind speed, then you have much thinner boundary layer. Okay, again, boundary layer affects the photosynthesis and transpiration. Thickness equal to resistance, basically. So that means thicker is more resistance, right? Or greater resistance. That means restricting photosynthesis and transpiration. Okay, are you with me? Okay, okay. So this is a great way to visualize. Um, but you can also compute average boundary layer in a theoretical approach. There is, a, you know, all the reported equations to compute boundary layer thickness over the leaf, um, and uh, you can see the relationship um, that way too. But again, so this is a um, simplified um, relationship to, for you to understand. So the high wind and low wind and boundary layer thick, thickness is um, smaller under the high wind, and then under the low wind, uh, boundary layer thickness is um, greater. Okay, so this one um, is another um, good example to see actually how boundary layer is created. This is an old, old video, educational video created, I don't know how many years ago, but um, um, I want to show this uh, so that you may be able to see better. Okay, so I'm going to bring this. Here. It's a YouTube video. Flow is quite different. We shall look at what causes boundary layers, how they grow, how they respond to pressure gradients, and the difference in behavior of laminar and turbulent layers. Before attempting to understand the boundary layer flow over this object, we shall look at the flow of a viscous fluid along the flat plate alone. These streamlines of water flowing in a channel are made visible with hydrogen bubbles generated by electrolysis. 
the flow is uniform and laminar. The fact that the timeline, the vertical patches of bubbles, remain perpendicular to the streamlines shows that the unobstructed flow is free of vorticity. Here is the flow over a plate. The flow is two-dimensional and laminar. Upstream of the plate, the flow is still uniform, but in the fluid layers near the plate, the velocities are much lower and vorticity is present. You see the space, which is the boundary layer? In the narrow boundary layer region adjacent to the plate, the shearing forces and inertia forces are of equal importance in determining the motion of fluid elements. Outside of this region, the shear stress can be neglected. The thickness of the boundary layer increases along the length of the plate. Fluid deceleration is transferred from one fluid layer to another by viscosity. There you go. Moving the camera with the free stream velocity will give a better view of the boundary layer growth. Isn't it neat? Yeah. So this is actually a 10-minute um, lecture video. So if you want to see the whole thing, that's the one. And I have the link of this video in the D2L site if you want to complete watching it. Um, all right. So, OK. So this is, yes, TJ. Yeah, because of the re the resistance. Which is increasing resistance, so if that uh, pillar wasn't in, pulled away, <coughs> would it still get the same effect? Um, s because it's still laminar, boundary layer, within the boundary layer, it's still laminar flow. Mm -hmm. But if you go much farther, it's going to be turbulent. And then you probably see that bubble, mm -hmm. you know, circulating. Um, I think it's a, the, I think the setting, if I understand correct, is in the liquid. Mm -hmm. So there is a surface and liquid, and then they have a micro bubbles, so that the white band is actually a bunch of bubbles, mm -hmm. and that traveling at the same speed, and then object is right here, and then start creating boundary layer. So that's how they visualize. But you know, the, the water and air is basically the fluid, so it's, it's basically the same way. Um, Okay, so this is sort of um, cartoon, but it's visualizing sort of conceptually, um, uh, uh, you know, the boundary layer. But important thing is that's both sides, right? Let's see, we have a laminar flow and leaf is sitting there. And then again, windward is very small, almost none, boundary layer, and then begins developing that, and then large. So depending on the wind speed, this thickness changes, right? Right. So the, um, let's see, where am I? Yeah, so by the way, this is from the growth chamber handbook. So if you actually measure the micro environment, wind speed, you know, the um, distribution, vertical distribution, then you should be able to create this kind of graph so this is um, a wind, so the x-axis is wind, so almost zero on the top of leaf, and then uh, wind is increasing within the boundary layer, and then uh, beyond the boundary layer, um, you have um, a constant wind. Again, this is a standardized condition, laminar flow, right? And then that is affecting the profile of humidity, for example, or temperature, or CO2, all right? Because um, CO2 and vapor diffuse between the air and uh, plant, right? And then let's say humidity, this is a vapor. Um, um, this is, again, the, uh, the vertical profile. So what it is showing is that, again, x-axis is the humidity level. So um, what it is showing is on the surface, 
you know, of the leaf, the humidity is very high, okay? And then decline to the level of the ambient humidity. And then that gradual reduction of humidity is happening in the boundary layer, okay? Because of the air velocity difference, okay? Um, so the, in this case, the high, high vapor pressure, or the, sorry, high concentration of um, moisture is at the leaf surface. So the moisture basically diffuses from here to there, and then this boundary layer thickness affects the diffusion of um, vapor. Same thing you can think about for CO2. Maybe CO2 is, is opposite, almost like a mirror image. So if I have to draw a CO2, um, uh, profile, CO2 is probably like that, right? That's CO2, okay? So the high in the air, and then um, because, uh, assume this is under photosynthesizing condition, so that inside the stomata, it's lower, and therefore it's diffusing into, right? And then boundary layer affecting this profile. Okay, temperature, it's, it's based on the heat. Heat is also affected. Heat transfer is affected by boundary layer. Therefore, you see this kind of profile. Okay, it, it could be, in this case, um, in this case, um, uh, the example is showing when temperature in the leaf is much higher than air temperature, but it could be opposite, depending on, depending on the conditions. And we learn more about leaf temperature and air temperature relationship, which is a little bit complex at this point. Okay? All right. And this boundary layer thickness is, is, is going to change by the wind velocity. All right. Uh, oops. Hello, clear. All right. So this is actual measurement, um, how wind velocity is affecting boundary layer thickness. Um, so wind speed up to 1.0 meter per second, um, it's, it's declining boundary layer uh, thickness. Uh, and then two lines here showing different leaf size, different leaf size. The small leaf having a thicker boundary layer, larger leaf, having um, a smaller boundary layer. Why leaf size matters? So go back to, go back to the first slide here. So, um, so the leaf size is basically the distance uh, along the traveling direction of the wind. So the small, small size of you know, leaf doesn't give a chance to um, uh, doesn't give a chance to the um, boundary layer to develop. Um, therefore, the average boundary layer thickness is going to be much smaller than wider, you know, wider leaf, because now the air needs to travel over that wide leaf um, width, and therefore the average boundary layer is going to be thicker, and therefore resistance is greater. Okay, so the thickness affects and wind velocity affects. Okay, so here we started talking about the range of um, wind velocity. So now I want to take you guys to the greenhouse again and then see the range of air movement or the air velocity inside the greenhouse. How do we measure? We have sensor. Um, this is a um, uh, um, hot wire anemometer, and this is basically wire and uh, um, uh, uh, heating up um, uh, the wire, and then measuring the temperature, how temperature changes according to the wind. When wind is faster, then temperature decline quicker, and then it can give you the number of wind velocity computed. So it's a cool um, um, instrument. And let me quickly install this to um, my PVC. Oh, while I'm doing that, I'm going to show you.
Very high tech. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, here, if you can see. Um, you see wire? Yeah. And then that is directional sensor. So if you I turn this, you, s you don't see the window. So you have to face the sensor to the wind direction. Um, not many sensor can um, measure the uh, wind with um, all the directions. So this is the one we are going to use. All right. Any volunteer? No? It's so simple. So it's push on, right? Oops, hello. And it shows meter per second, right? Right? Super simple. Any volunteer? Hey, Caitlin. All right, so you take this. So what we are doing is going to greenhouse together so that we know sort of, you know, range of greenhouse, wind velocity. And then again, I'm going to switch this off. And All right, so we are in the greenhouse. Um, come in, come in. So we have sensor here, and uh, right now, let's measure. Wherever. Anywhere. 0 0.06 meter per second, right now. Okay, so yeah, because air is not moving. So we have a fan moving, right? So, um, 0 0.08, 0 0.11. So here, over there, I can see the leaf is moving a little bit, you know, shaking. Let's measure the wind velocity. A little bit far, a little bit far away, so that you, you don't, the, the, the leaf is not blocking. Yeah, that would be great. The uh, same height. Can you read loud? Uh, 0.82 meters per second. 0.82 meters per second. Okay, so let's, let's try to measure the impact of the fan. Can reach. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, someone is helping. <laughs> right, uh, two, 4.5. 4.5. Okay, so the in front of, right in front of the fan, 4.5. Okay, and then this one is point, what, what was that? Point 0.8? Yeah. Point 0.8 meter per second when, you know, the leaf is shaking like that. It's, a, it's about, it's about that, you know, wind velocity. So I'm going to turn off the fan. If I'm allowed to, I hope I am. Um, just for now. All right. Can you measure the same? Yeah. Uh, in front of the fan or the leaf? Uh, the leaf. Okay. Yeah. Uh, point zero seven. Point zero seven. Okay. So huge reduction, right? Mm -hmm. So the the um. running when vents are closed and then also no you know the mechanical ventilation is running what's the purpose of the fan moving air to to do what circulate the co2 circulate the co2 and temperature, temperature. yeah so that making more uniform temperature distribution so that's the original design of the fan okay not necessarily creating optimum air movement. So we are going to see what is optimum air movement. Um, by the way, there used to be a CO2 injector here. It's in the back. Oh, it's in the back. Oh, I'm glad because it was a real strange design. Um, but anyway, so um, if we can see. Yeah, if you stand in this row, and then look to the back, there's, there's a yellow tubing, and that's a natural gas, and that's the CO2 generator, since we found CO2 last time, if you want to see that. Overhead, that's a little CO2 injector, um, combustion. I don't want to go deep in the row, so. Yeah, you see that? So that's basically CO2. So when vents are closed, they want to inject CO2, and then they want to run, Right on the, in front of the 
Japan it was four, Mira was second. And when fans are on, uh, when you know you see the shaking leaves like that, the velocity was 0.8. Mm -hmm. Okay? Alright, so let's go back to the classroom and then finish up. Okay. Back to PC. Okay. So now this graph looks so, you know, more meaningful, right? Now you know the range of wind you have in the greenhouse. Outside is, it's, it's all over, all right? So um, our highest wind speed in the greenhouse is right here, 0.8, around the plants. We could see 4.0, but we never put plants under 4.0 wind speed. Okay, so the boundary layer thickness is almost, you know, sharply declining. Um, in one case, like this one is a wide leaf. The leaf size is five centimeter, and this one is one centimeter. So the smaller the leaf size, because traveling paths is small, average boundary layer is, is smaller. When wider leaves is considered, then development is much bigger, therefore the average you know, across boundary layer is greater. All right, a um, little bit more, you know, the um, relationship here, basically the same thing, so that this is wind and uh, width relative to the wind direction, okay? And then, um, so this is the width, um, 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter, 30 centimeter, big, big leaf, 50 centimeter, all right? Um, wind velocity, um, low one, and then the high one, 2.0. It's it basically showing at the, the same wind, uh, sorry, the same leaf width, the greater the wind velocity is, then smaller the boundary layer thickness, therefore the resistance. Okay, so that is a graph showing that. So that this is the highest wind velocity. This is the low, uh, second highest and then declining wind velocity and increasing boundary layer resistance. All right. Um, the same thing. So all these are theoretical data. You, you can compute this relationship um, so that this is, again, wind, uh, leaf width, and then new value is the wind velocity. And this one is now computed net photosynthetic rate. Okay, computed net photosynthetic rate. And uh, you can see that um, increasing velocity at any width, increasing net photosynthetic rate. Higher the velocity is, then higher the net photosynthetic rate because reducing boundary layer and reducing resistance. Okay, all right. Um, a couple of more is basically telling the same thing, effect of wind speed um, and also leaf size on the boundary layer resistance. Okay, so the resistance is greater when the leaf is bigger and uh, the, uh, the velocity is smaller. Okay, the same thing, different notation. So um, when you consider the leaves like this, okay, um, right hand side is obviously narrower, yes? Oh, uh, probably it's coming from the lower. Yeah, don't worry about that one. Yeah. Don't worry about that one. I don't think it's uh, truncated. It's just a leftover from the lower one. Yeah. Because uh, um, resistance should be second par. In this case, centimeter, but second par meter, right? So, okay. All right. And uh, um, yeah, so two different leaves, uh, morphology, and then narrower leaves probably having much smaller boundary layer compared to uh, thicker leaf. And so under the exactly the same conditions, um, the plant having um, morphology like um, right hand side has much higher capacity of photosynthesis because of the boundary layer. So that's very unique. All right, that's very unique. Can you say like unique for the plant? Yeah, so the so the the leaf width is much narrower, mm -hmm. right? So that means boundary layer is thinner. 
than the leaf left on side. Okay, so under the exactly the same conditions, exactly the same wind velocity, temperature and everything, because of the thinner boundary layer, right hand side, this, this type of leaves should have higher photosynthetic rate if you measure under the same condition because of the, you know, boundary layer. So if you look at, you know, the, the different plant morphology in, 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 with regard to boundary layer resistance, it's very interesting, you know, the morphology affects the photosynthetic capacity also. Okay, all right, so this one is actual measurement data of transpiration rate and net photosynthetic rate of a leaf. And this group use sweet potato plant because it's very nice, flat, you know, leaf. So it's so easy to handle um, uh, to, to actually do the uh, boundary layer related study. Um, so this one is net photosynthetic rate and uh, x-axis is the air current speed. Right, and then you can see the increasing trend as increasing uh, wind speed. And then you can see that now the maximum response they tested was up to 1.0. So that's exactly the range you see in the greenhouse. Okay, beyond that probably, you know, plants might get desiccated, therefore they might close tomata, so the influence of wind velocity is not as good as within these range you know, 0.1 to 1.0 meter per second um, is the range you see. And you, said, you, you, you know, when, when, when the fan was, when the horizontal circulating fans were off, we saw that the velo velocity level was less than 0.1, right? Less than 0.1 meter per second. So we are talking about this level, right? So 0.1 is here. And then when leaf is moving like this, it was right here, 0 0.8, all right? So the photosynthetic difference is about 50% greater than less than 0.1, okay? Photosynthetic rate could be increased by increasing wind velocity within this range, okay? But interestingly, nobody designs greenhouse to, you know, achieve the optimum air movement around the plants, around the plants, um, you know, to enhance the photosynthesis. So what's, the level? what's the optimum do you think by looking at here? What do you want to shoot? by looking at this. If this is true for all the crops, 0.6, yeah, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. I usually recommend growers, you know, target 0.5, just to be safe. So it looks like 0 0.5, 6, 8 is about the same. And then moving more air is more energy requirement. Therefore, minimum air movement to maximize photosynthesis, to me, it's around 0.5. You have a question? Yeah, so if it is, the question is, what if the, the, the velocity is greater than 1.0? So the beyond, beyond this range, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, boundary layer doesn't, you know, so boundary layer declines, right, when wind velocity is higher. So theoretically, you are talking about, um, so the decline, but decline rate is probably small, right? But anyway, um, instantaneously, I would assume this doesn't change beyond 1.0 if you are measuring instantaneous photosynthesis. But um, it would probably create um, mechanical stress, and then also um, because of the um, uh, thinner boundary layer, it might desiccate more. Um, so a long time, I don't think it's a good idea to grow 1.0. Even real-world scenarios where there's the airflow isn't laminate, I could feel like it would that would still be increased photosynthesis? 
Um, the actually no. So the real world scenario, the air is turbulent, and then in that case, um, turbulent air has much higher diffusion coefficient. So that means um, boundary layer resistance is smaller um, under the turbulent air. And so um, I would say this, this graph is going to shift a little bit. Yeah, but it's really difficult to create that situation. So, um, but the important thing is we are talking about very narrow range of air movement. And the uh, increase of air movement is very important um, uh, to enhance the photosynthesis. Um, so that's the demonstration in terms of net photosynthetic rate and transpiration rate. And then you can also see here that two are actually performing the same way, because both are the diffusion and sharing the same resistance, boundary layer resistance. Yeah, so um, the direction of wind is also um, a factor. And then also the surface um, roughness is also another factor. So the, some plants have hairs, trichomes, we call trichomes, and that is creating more boundary layer. So in that case, hairy plants probably require much faster um, air current speed or velocity to maximize the gas exchange or yeah, photosynthesis and transpiration. Yes, TJ. Oh, um, under natural ventilation or? Maximum. Maximum. So in, in the teaching greenhouse, there's four exhaust fans. Yeah. So are these air speeds when all four fans are running or just one? This one is in an experimental setup. You know, so it's not exactly in the greenhouse. So it's more like a controlled environment but under electric lighting. But I know that when all the fans are running, um, you may see the air stream close to 0.5 in one point, but if you start measuring, for example, canopy, inside the canopy, lower leaves, the air is pretty much stagnant. Yeah, we could have demonstrated that when we were there. You know, what if the old vents are running? And uh, that's what I recall when we did that last time. So, you know, depending on the location, it, it's very much limited. Even though top of the leaf is shaking, the lower leaves, or most of the leaves are not even moving, right? So that means pretty much stagnant air situation. Plants are growing right now in the greenhouse. So would you say that in that greenhouse with maximum ventilation, the air flow is still too slow? Mm -hmm. I think so, relative to this, mm -hmm. you know, the optimum range. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Oh, here it is. Um, yeah, so it, it could be 0.2 to 1.0 depending on the location. Yeah, depending on the location. Uh, forced ventilation situation. Natural ventilation always, always 0.2 or less. Um, and so the generalized um, as 1.0 or less in a greenhouse. So exactly the range affect, you know, the, the range you see the influence of air velocity on the photosynthesis and transpiration rates. Okay, all right. So, um, so how to measure the boundary layer resistance? There's a way to measure it, but um, it's, it's again, um, it's, it's not real um, situation measurement. It's usually use a wet um, paper and measure the, um, measure the um, temperature of the surface, and then also the humidity on top of that, and measure the, the loss of water, you know, the rate of lo water loss over the uh, wet paper, and then sort of estimate using Ohm's law, basically, using the Ohm's law and then figuring out what is the boundary layer resistance. So that's how you, you can do. Um, it's one way to do. Okay, so this one is another interesting, you know, the result I want to share, share with you. So this one is um, um, gross chamber conditions, um, and then um, they measure the whole canopy um, evaporation rate, because it's easy to measure, 
um, evaporation or transpiration in the, the loss of the plants or, uh, or the, yeah, the transpiration rate and evaporation from the soil. Um, so, so what they tested was over the canopy of young seedlings, this is, I believe, eggplant um, seedlings, very dense seedlings growing over the tray, growing in the tray, um, multi-cell, you know, seedling tray. And one condition is a horizontal air movement. They tested horizontal air movement. Um, and the other condition is a vertical air movement. So the air traveling through the canopy, okay? Um, so the boundary layer is created over individual leaf, right? As you saw in one of the um, cartoons, both sides. But also, as a macro scale, you can see boundary layer created over the canopy too, okay? Because the whole thing is creating almost as a surface, okay? So the same velocity, either horizontal or vertical, and they had several velocities um, starting from around 0.15 all the way to 0.267, all right? And then they compare the evaporation rate in this case because it's easier to measure. Um, and then you see that vertical air current, the same velocity, just different direction. Vertical air current is enhancing, the, in this case, evaporation transpiration rate a lot more than horizontal. And why? Because horizontal air create boundary layer over the top of the canopy so that's really restricting the, you know, the um, water loss from the plants because it's another big boundary layer over the top versus horizontal air movement. Air can go through so the penetrate, forced penetration, right? And then individual leaves inside the canopy are subject to the air movement too. So that enhanced air movement in the canopy, enhanced the boundary layer uh, or reduce the boundary layer resistance, right? So therefore, as a whole canopy, um, um, transpiration was enhanced. So this can be interpreted because this is the same, you know, the water vapor and CO2 is side by side. So this can be interpreted as potential influence on the photosynthetic rate. Okay, potential influence on the photosynthetic rate, whether it is horizontally moving or vertical moving, vertically moving, right? Quite interesting, isn't it? But I haven't seen the application of this understanding. You know, if you put the air through the canopy like that, it should be able to um, enhance the gas exchange, but I haven't seen a practical design. So if you are an engineer looking for a project, it might be a great project to design how to do that, you know, in, in low cost, not so much, you know, equipment or fans. Caitlin. In, in the veggie box, um, is it horizontal as well? There's no particular. <laughs> uh, Caitlin is asking my veggie box, which I will show you sometime later. Um, it's a sort of mini vertical growing system. Um, like a vertical farming, and then there are shelving um, to grow lettuce and leaf, leafy crop hydroponically inside using uh, LEDs as a lighting source. Um, my veggie box doesn't have a sophisticated design in terms of air movement, so it's, it's pretty much low air movement situation. So I, I have one fan just to circulate the air, but it's not, it's, it's not even optimum at all. Yes? On a, on a shelving unit like that, do you think you need small, like, computer yeah. fans? Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, we, I, I have seen those facilities, you know, having DC fans um, attached to the, yeah, so it's, that's probably one good example, but it's still horizontal airflow, though. Still horizontal airflow. Oh, unless you put it underneath. Oh, underneath the, the upper shelf. 
Yeah. So, okay. So you guys, it's get, getting a really, really innovative. Yeah. So I like to see something like that in the future because I'm going to talk um, probably um, when we talk about nutrient deficiency. I'm going to talk about tip ban and prevention, and then air movement is very, very critical. So boundary layer, all right? Okay. Um, so. Boundary layer uh, basics, um, as a plant scientist, you got to remember. So this is sort of summary, you know, the points you need to remember, okay? So the whole lecture was basically enhance your understanding. So I use simplified um, situations so that it is easier to understand. But basically, boundary layer over leaf um, affects gas exchange, right? The photosynthetic rate and transpiration rate. And I didn't talk too much about heat exchange, um, but heat is also affected. You know, the heat transfer from the air to the leaf, you know, having the same resistance, boundary layer resistance, and that is affected. So when boundary layer is smaller, the heat dissipates either way. So that when leaf is high temperature, heat dissipates from the leaf to the air, right? And then in that case, boundary layer is small, then dissipates much quicker than the, the opposite case, you know, thicker boundary layer, all right? Um, and boundary layer resistance is affected by uh, air current speed, right? And leaf shape, width, and length, and uh, surface roughness, okay? Surface roughness. So speaking about heat dissipation, um, going back to this, so the narrower leaves versus wide leaf, um, in terms of heat dissipation or the heat transfer, narrower leaves should have much more efficient in terms of removing heat from the plant body to the air, right? So that's why arid land plants often have a very thin you know, leaves because boundary layer over the plants is much smaller, easier to get rid of heat you know, accumulated by radiation. So that's another way to look at, you know, how plants design their, you know, architecture um, based on the conditions. So you would never see wide, big, humongous leaf in the arid uh, uh, environment, right? It's usually tropical under the forest, you know, shady area. So that's another way to look at. All right. Okie dokie. I think we are a little early, but that's okay. Um,